At age six, Tori began violin lessons. In the fourth grade, she earned her place in a New York high school orchestra. She then studied dance and took acting classes before beginning her career in modeling at the age of 15. This is when her acting career began as well. Actress, advocate, philanthropist, and producer, Tori Joelle DeVito is best known for her incredible sixth season run on the NBC drama, Chicago Med, playing Natalie Manning. Today, we go back to Tori's roots with her love for the violin and the passion and purpose now that drives her as a philanthropist. From the violin to the light within, we explore purpose in the form of passion. Life is all about relationships, from our relationship with others, with the world, with ourselves. But today, Tori, I'd love to begin with the relationship you have with the violin. My question for you here is when and how did this relationship begin? And what is it that you love about this instrument? Um, well, first off, I'll start with how it began. Um, I actually, so my father's a drummer. He drummed for Billy Joel for 30 years. And I grew up going on tour with him all the time. And there was one tour, the Stormfront tour, um, was the only time that Billy had a violinist on tour with them. I was, I think, six. Well, I must have been six because I know I started violin when I was six. So I was probably five or six. And I was so enamored with her. I followed her around everywhere. And at the end of the tour, I asked my parents if I could play. So I actually, at a very young age, really sought it out myself. And my dad's first question to her was, will she lose her hearing? Because music has made my dad all but lose his hearing. And she was like, no, I think she'll be good. <laughs> so I started lessons and you know, I just grew up with this amazing instrument. And it's funny, my relationship with it has changed and morphed, I would say like year after year for the last, what has it been now? I'm 30, almost 39. So like 33 years that I've been playing. Um, it's changed so much because when I was younger, I loved it so much. And then when I got into high school, I actually, I, I hate saying this, I was like a little embarrassed. I would hide it from my friends. I didn't want to be in the school orchestra. I was in the Florida Symphony Youth Orchestra in Florida and I was traveling over to Germany and um, Austria and playing violin and I was getting hired to play for weddings at such a young age and I was playing all over and some of my friends didn't even know I played. And then, and then I like reclaimed it as I got older and out of those teen awkward years where you just want to fit in and like reclaimed it again and then I chose, um, I went through a phase where um, I had to choose, do I want to do this path or do I want to choose acting? And I chose acting and so acting kind of took, and violin kind of took a back seat. And when I moved to LA, I started doing different things like outside of the classical realm and I played on Raphael Sadiq's album and Tommy Davidson hired me to play with Brian McKnight's um, band for one of his shows at this club in LA when I was like 18 and it was the first time I had done things that wasn't classical it was jazz and it was also you know more pop stuff and and I got into that and then I went through a lot of sadness with the violin because when acting took over so much and I wasn't playing as much when I would pick it up I felt like I wasn't as good as I was when I was like 16 years old and then when you are trained classically, there's so much perfectionism that comes with classical. You know what I mean? You can't go off the cuff. If if a note is off, it's wrong. Do you know what I mean? There's no mm -hmm. like, oh, well, it was a little flat, but it sounded good. It's like, no, it was wrong. So I would get really upset and then it made me not want to play. And, um, and then I got to finally play on Chicago Med and I had really waited to meld acting and violin together for something that I really loved. And so then I started falling in love with it again because I was like getting to marry my two worlds. And then last July, I actually fractured my finger. And so um, that is still healing. So I haven't been able to play for July and I miss it so much. So now I feel like I'm gonna enter into another phase where I'm gonna have to have so much kindness and compassion for myself when I do start playing again, because I know it's not gonna be the same, I know it's gonna be rough, um, but my new goal is actually to learn how to just jam out with friends. Like, I've never been able to do that before, because when you play classical music, I learned how to play by ear and then read music. And like I said, there's no improv in classical, so when people just wanna jam with me, I'm like, I don't know how, like, give me music or hum something and I'll copy it. Like. So that's my new goal with it, is to find a new love with it, to be able to be 
less perfect with it. Um, and that's really scary. When you're starting this new chapter with the violin, you have to give yourself grace, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And allow yourself that imperfection to reach the <laughs> perfection that you want. So. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So, so here's the thing. So Joshua Bell said, yes, when you play a violin piece, you are a storyteller and you are telling a story. It seems to me that this also applies to acting as well. Mm -hmm. When you step into a role, you are a storyteller and you're telling that character story. So Tori, my question for you now is of all the characters you've played, because there's been a number, uh, is there a specific character or a specific scene that you felt really mirrored you in your life? Mm. You know, it's so interesting. I do oddly, and this might freak some people out because I've played some really crazy characters. Um, every character I've ever played has a lot of me in it. And it, I felt so comforted when I read a quote from Ryan Gosling when he said that he wished he was like a better character actor and he doesn't know how people do that and all of his characters have him in it. And I was like, oh my God, yes, that's that's like me too. I have to blend my characters and me together. Um, but I will say when I played Natalie on Chicago Med, there were a lot of times where I would read a script and I would be like, is my home bugged? Like, are they listening to me? Because she's literally like mirroring everything I'm going through in my personal life right now. And it's really freaking me out. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it becomes that whole thing. Just art imitating life, life, life imitating art. You know, I don't know. But I do think when you're really connected to your art, no matter what it is, music, acting, painting, you know, whatever your expression of art is. I do think it starts to blend. Like when you're that connected to it, it's just, I think I feel impossible for it not to. Yeah, wow, which is probably why you are the um, incredible actress that you are because you put all of you you into it. Yeah. Um, you know, so as many have, let, let's stay on this violin for a minute. So as many have come to understand, there is one thing that you must understand and accept about the violin there is no success, right? There's no success without failure. So exploring mm -hmm. this specific truth, now going beyond the violin, can you share a personal story, a personal example in your life where from failure, you found success? Oh my goodness, yes. I mean, I feel like what people don't understand, especially about wanting to get into the acting industry, um, when I get uh, asked for advice by younger people who want to get into it, I always tell them, be prepared to get told no every single day. You know, I and I can't tell you, I can't even, I've been told no more, way more than I've ever been told yes in my line of work, in my industry. But there's so many times where I've been so sad when I would get so close to a role, I'd go through the screen test and be down to me and one other girl, and then I wouldn't get it. And it is so true that sometimes the universe stops you from doing something because something even bigger is waiting. I remember I really wanted this one show. I don't even remember what it was called. I don't even remember, I don't even know if it ever even came on the air, to be honest with you. It was a pilot and I wanted it so badly. And I ended up, I got the call that I didn't get it and I was so depressed. And then like two weeks later, I got med. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that pilot never even got picked up. Had I gotten it, I wouldn't have gotten med. And that literally in this line of work happens all the time. I have messed up so many auditions. I have fallen flat on my face so many times. Oh my gosh. I. There were so many times where, I mean, this one time I was uh, screen testing for a movie and I, it was in front of the Wayne's brothers. It was for one of their spoof movies. It was the spoof on the dance movie. And I went in there and I had to do the dance part and I blacked out, I literally blacked out. And when I stopped, <laughs> they were all just staring at me with like blank stares and I was like, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go now. Do you know what I mean? Just so, I don't think people are aware that to be an actor, to be an artist, you have to put yourself out there in the most vulnerable way and be so willing for people to tell you, you know what? 
I'm not into what you're presenting and then still go home and have to believe in what you yourself are presenting and what you yourself are showcasing and go, you know what? It wasn't their flavor, but it'll be somebody else's flavor and it'll always be my flavor. And I have to believe in that flavor to keep putting it out there in this world. I mean, even still, you know, I lost a role this, this summer and I hadn't been this excited for a part since getting med and since being off med. And it was down to me and one other person and I lost it. And I was like, oh no. So still, and I just, you know, say to myself, you know what? Something better is gonna come. That's that's why that's happening. So I don't even know one failure story, but I will say that it's just a compilation and it's weekly. Mm. <laughs> it's a compilation, I love that. And I love that, you know, because so oftentimes people say, well, things happen for a reason, but we also have to believe then, if we truly yeah. do that, we have to say that things don't happen for a reason. To your point, Absolutely. if you would have got that, you know, that other role, yeah, might not have happened. Wouldn't have happened. Exactly. And that show didn't even get picked up. And, you know, it's just all the things just fell into place, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. So you got to trust that. And when you do, when you do have failure, keep your eyes open because I feel like that when, especially when you have really good work ethic and you're really putting your all out, out there, I believe there's a reason. I also believe that it builds character. I mean, I can't imagine my life without failure. It builds strength. It builds character. It builds self-confidence. But when you have failure, you really have to listen. That's when I listen the most. I'm like, okay, I didn't get that, why? And sometimes when I don't get things consistently, I even look around and I go, okay, I know acting's my path and I know I love it and I know it'll come, but what else am I meant to be doing right now? You know, like why, why is this not landing in my lap like it has before? Or why am I not getting the roles I want right now? Why? Maybe, I, okay, maybe there's something else I should be doing. Where where should I be in service of right now that my, my time is so open right now? So what else am I meant to be doing? You know, I feel like failure is when you really need to listen to what you're being called to do or else you'll miss the opportunity. Yeah, Anna, and such a great point because we are these multifaceted creatures. We're not just one thing that defines yes. us. There are yes. many things, so. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I, I do just have to ask one more violin thing because it's really what? fun to ask, you know, <laughs> a great conversation around this fabulous instrument. Uh, so the violin is then recognized as the backbone of most classical music and plays a leading role when it comes to the expression of emotion. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to causes and mm -hmm. your philanthropic Bone. What causes are you personally and emotionally most tied to? Mm. Um, the crux of my work right now in that area has really been um, empowering youth to know their boundaries and know how to say no and know their rights when it comes to sexual consent. I've been working with this amazing organization called Safe Bay. And that is, that's the crux of their work. That's what they do. They have a whole curriculum and they teach kids about sexual consent and assault. Um, I feel like when I was younger, I grew up, as I'm sure you know, and a lot of people, you know, listening to this know, um, in that, you know, boys will be boys. And it's, when I say boys will be boys, it's not just a conversation for women. Boys need to grow up knowing their rights too, and sexual assault happens to boys too, and they need to be a part of this conversation. This is not just a girl issue, and I always try to stress that because sometimes I do feel like young boys feel left out of the conversation, and they are very much included and need to be included, but um, I feel like I grew up in that, you know, you don't talk about it, you just, you know, push it away, you don't want to ruffle feathers and, you know, getting heckled should be just be a compliment, you know, people talking inappropriately about your body is a compliment. And um, I went through stuff, I, I saw a play called Slut the Play when I was like 25 and a girl was assaulted in the play. but. Um, it wasn't through sexual penetration. It was, you know, she was touched inappropriately and, and she said she was raped. And when I was 25 years old, I was like, wait, that's rape? Like, I didn't even know 
that that meant you were and and all this stuff came crashing onto me and i started realizing i had nobody in my life when i was younger i mean my mother is amazing the women in my life are amazing but they grew up even in a more you know a generation that was like oh getting told like you know whatever is is a compliment but and i was like oh my god i had nobody that empowered me in that way in the in the way that i could say no and be okay not being liked maybe by the cool kids or something because i said no and so once i learned this information and i realized what i was lacking as a teenager i said to myself i was like i want to do this work and i want to make sure that no teenage kid crosses my path without knowing their no without knowing their line without feeling empowered in that too you know not afraid and what's so beautiful is this new generation of kids they are so empowered already and i think with all the knowledge of like you know the access to all this information that they have they know more than i even know now i'm still learning i feel like i'm learning with them um so that is something i'm really i'm really really passionate about you know just empowering our youth um female rights right now is something i'm very passionate about i feel like we're in such a weird time where we're teetering on this like really odd balance of being more empowered and having a voice more than ever but also on the brink of getting it all taken away in such a weird archaic way that is blowing my mind so that is very um I'm very passionate about and also animals um living a cruelty free life for the sake of animals and also for the sake of our environment those three things are kind of just things that I wake up and that are on my mind every day <laughs> right right well with good reason with everything that's going on in the news that we see and that we hear uh for sure um yeah. thank you for sharing that uh yeah thank you you know so for the many causes where more care and more awareness is needed uh i'd like to speak because this is another cause that uh, i've heard you're quite close to end of life care is something mm. you've been involved with and had you've been an amazing ambassador for uh, specifically you mentioned in um one of your quotes no one dies alone mm -hmm. and how that really struck you and that's such a powerful statement and mission so my question now is is there a story you can share about what drew you specifically to to hospice and into this cause to to provide that comfort and that care yeah um you know, it's actually really it's one of those things where I I it, hospice was definitely meant to be in my life because it really kind of landed in my lap without me seeking it out. Well, I kind of by way. So, I was doing a show called One Tree Hill. I was 24 years old and it was the first time I was on a really popular show and all the dreams were coming true. I was like, this is amazing. I can't believe this is my life. Um and that show was very challenging. It had a lot of dark energy on it. Um, I kind of just like kept to myself, would play. I had this like Nintendo DS and I would go back to the hotel room and play like the word game or whatever was on there like by myself at night. I, I did make some friends, but I was just kind of like scared of my own shadow on that show for some reason. It just was like the energy was something I wasn't used to and I wasn't getting outside as much because you know, when you're on set, you're like, in reconditioned air all day. You don't really see the day go to night and night go to day and all those things. And um, I felt myself getting really, really depressed. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense. I'm finally doing like what I want to be doing. This is why I moved to LA. This, this is what I want to be doing. And I knew that I loved it, but I couldn't figure out why I was depressed. And I was like, okay, so I think I need to use myself in a different way so that I'm not just, because also in our industry, um, there's so much focus that goes on vanity. You know what I mean? And sometimes you become too focused on yourself in that way. And I think too much focus on yourself in that way will cause depression because that's not anything that really matters or really counts. And so when you're just wrapped up in this like self thing and you're worried about how you look or, you know, this and that, it just becomes kind of a little ugly and it was making me really sad. So I thought to myself, what can I do to take myself out of my own head? And so I thought maybe I'll volunteer at a children's hospital. And so I went to Google it one day when I was at home. And the first thing that popped up on my Google search was hospice. And I had no idea what hospice, I didn't even know what hospice was and I clicked on it. 
and I called them and they were like, oh, we're actually having a volunteer training this weekend for the next three weeks. And I was like, sign me up. I went and I just fell in love with it. I didn't know what hospice was. And so I did inpatient volunteering for about eight years, which was so amazing. It taught me so much. And whenever I would get, you know, down or something, it just reminded me of what was real. And every time I got a patient, they were all different and they all wanted to tell different stories. But the one thing that was the same between every patient that actually, you know, could talk to tell stories still, they all wanted to talk about who they loved, who they regretted not loving, their family, where they traveled to. Nobody talked about their job. Nobody talked about money. Nobody talked about any of that stuff. And so it just really put this light in my life and this perspective. And I loved being a part of the process of helping somebody transition from this earth into whatever is next, which I have no idea, but whatever's next. And I loved it so much that actually, to go back to what we had talked about previously, you know, I've had a lot of downtime since being off med and I'm so excited for what's next and I can't wait to get that job that I really love. Um, but I was like, okay, I do have all this downtime. Like I, you know, I wonder why. And I started looking into um, death doula training because I, I realized I'm not in the same place long enough right now to continue doing inpatient volunteering. And so I was like, oh my God, maybe I should get my death doula training while I have this time. So that kind of has opened up to me, which, you know, if you don't pay it, if I would have just sulked and been like, dang, I wanted to go from one show to the next and why am I not on a new show right now? You know, it's like, no, I think I'm meant to be doing this right now. And then that will fall into place when it's time for that. So, yeah. Wow. And I, so I've never heard this term death doula. That is really fascinating and interesting to me. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it? Isn't it? I mean, if you think about it, to me, the reason why I loved hospice too, is I felt like it's really, you're just helping birth somebody again, right? We get birthed into this earth and then we birth into whatever's next. And so death doula makes sense to me. We have birth doulas. Why not have death doulas? And so, uh, yeah, somebody told me about it probably like a couple of years ago. I didn't know about it either. And it's just kind of been ruminating in my head. And uh, it's like, I have this time right now. Why not? Why not? I love it. That's uh, well, and, and because people spend so much time and so much tension and so much care at the beginning, like a life that's entering, but one that's exiting, why is that amount of care not there as well? So the fact that you're very passionate about it is, is awesome. Um, you know, so, so often I feel it's our personal evolutions that drive our public contributions. So here enters, I want to talk about uh, whose skin are you in? So the PETA campaign you were part of. Uh, so that messaging, I just love to choose fake snake and mock croc, wear vegan. So at this point, I would love to hear you share your personal journey as it pertains to being a vegetarian um, and then the, the vegan side of things as well. Where did it begin and where is it taking you now? So it actually began in a really silly way. Um, I was with my, uh, an ex, I, I think I was about 24 years old again. Yeah, I was 24. A lot came to me when I was 24. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he had gone on a fishing trip and he grew up in New Jersey. So not anywhere that he really went fishing or anything. We both grew up in a very like city, you know, a city life. We didn't, neither of us were big like campers, but he went, um, camping and fishing with some of his guy friends and he came back and he was like oh my god it was so weird we went fishing and you know all of his friends were used to like getting the fish and like hitting it over the head and having to like kill it you know and he's like I just couldn't do it it was so like oh my god and I had realized I fished when I would visit Michigan in the summers to see my grandparents and but I never had to do the hard part like that you know I was so little and I thought to myself I was like oh my god I couldn't do that to a fish and I was like, well, I couldn't kill a cow either. And I was like, well, if I don't have the strength to look it in the eye and kill it, I shouldn't be eating it. And I was like, that's it. I'm never eating meat again. And I literally, from that moment on, never ate meat again. I continued to eat fish until I was 29, and then I never ate fish again um, after 29. But, um, but yeah, so that's really how it started, it was just a weird story of my ex at the time boyfriend coming home and telling me that he couldn't kill a fish <laughs> and then it definitely evolved like it became about 
it started off about having the respect for animals, feeling like I couldn't. Then I just, the more I learned about, you know, factory farming and how they do that, I was like, oh my God, it's, you know, if people could actually go out and kill their own meat and use it for everything, I would respect it so much. But that's just not the way, especially in the States, nothing is done like that anymore. And then when I started learning about the environmental impact, that factory farming was having on the earth. And I was like, oh my God. And then, you know, when you learn about overfishing and how it's, you know, what they're doing to the dolphins and the sharks by way of overfishing and uh, oh my gosh, it just more and more confirms why. And I've gone in and out of veganism for a long time too. I actually currently right now just started on February 15th, a three month vegan challenge. Um, and like I like to say with everybody, you have to be gentle because there's so many things I was getting this um, drink from Starbucks with my cousin for three days in a row. And then I said, wait a second, isn't this oat milk? And they were like, no, that's, I'm like, shoot. So, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> you mess up here and there, but you have to be gentle with yourself. But I'm hoping that this time sticks because I really do want to start, stop eating, um, dairy, but, uh, but yeah, but my fashion has been vegan. I started going, um, vegan in my fashion probably around 29 when I stopped eating fish because I realized I was like wait a second I won't eat a burger but I'm wearing it like how does that make sense so <laughs> <laughs> um so I stopped doing that and then you know always have been really conscious of what I'm putting on my face or my hair or my body you know to be cruelty free and honestly like on like a soul level it just makes me feel lighter to know that everything mm -hmm. I'm doing is not hurting a creature do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and that for me just works. You know, I try to make sure that, because not a lot of people in my life are vegetarian or vegan. And I try to make sure that when I get asked questions, I answer them, but I'm not trying to sit here judging anyone or shaming anyone. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. everybody's got their own path, but for me, that just works. And that's awesome. And I love how you're talking about that. It was, you know, this story that you were told that, you know, and, and it was you sort of having a conversation with yourself. Why well, I wouldn't do this and why would I do this? And so that reflection, how a story can change so much. Yeah. So, you know, so let's switch gears yet again. And uh, so as an advocate for reproductive rights, you not only spoke at Planned Parenthood's bands off our bodies virtual rally you also went on celebrity jeopardy playing to support <laughs> parenthood i saw that um you know beyond this you shared your you shared your own personal abortion story and mm -hmm. an exclusive interview with people you've used not only your professional but your personal platform to support others first of all thank you um Second of all, for women who say, I'm not strong enough to stand by my truth or to share my story, please share what it is that gives you strength to do so. Where do you find your strength, Tori, to, to stand in your truth, to speak your story? Um, I think being aware of suffering that some women go through really lights a fire in me and makes me feel really passionate about this or seeing things kind of going in reverse or seeing injustices or um, ever since I was a kid, injustices have always just driven me crazy. I used to get so angry when I would see things um, that, that I felt weren't right um, in my heart or in my soul. And that really gives me the strength to say, you know what? I will use whatever part of me, whatever story. I, I always feel like it, even with friends or people I meet, I'm very much an open book. There's not much that you can't get out of me. I don't have like deep, dark secrets that I'm scared to tell. Like I'm a big fan of messing up and making mistakes and being messy and being human. So I am very comfortable. I always like joke, like my little sister, one of my, my one of my sisters, Marielle, she like, we've gone on trips before and she'll like climb the waterfall and she's like, wow, like she'll swim under things. And I'm always like so afraid of getting physically hurt. 
But then like, I will be the one to sit down with family members and be like, let's have this vulnerable conversation. And my sister's like, nope, 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 nope. So I'm like, <laughs> I'll take the, I like taking emotional risks more than physical risks. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I've always just been very open in that way. And so I think that that helps. And because it doesn't, um, like, like some people don't, which I totally appreciate and honor, like some people don't like sharing their stories like that. It's very difficult for them. And for whatever reason, it's not difficult for me. So I'm like, yeah, use me. I am such a huge advocate of never ever share something you're not ready to share. Do not feel bullied or pressured into having to scream at the rooftops how you feel right now. I know it is a very important time for us to use our voices, but never do something you feel uncomfortable around uh, until you are ready to do it. Because I do not believe somebody should put them, because I will say, and I know from experience at this point, people can be vicious, you know? Like sometimes I will share things in the most loving, open way and not, and, and actually still forget that people can be vicious. And when I see the viciousness come at me, I'll be like, oh, Oh my God, but I just shared that in love. How am I getting so much hate back? Oh my God. And that is not for everyone. Not everyone can handle that. And so like, please, like if you don't feel comfortable sharing something, don't share it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but but that's why it's uh, easy for me because it doesn't, it doesn't, just like when people say like, how can you do hospice? Like for some reason being around death doesn't bother me. Other things bother me that I can't do that somebody else can do. But if you can't be around death, then you, don't have to hospice volunteer and that's okay. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, so that kind of lights me up. Just knowing, I think at this point in my life, like understanding and knowing the strengths I have to offer and understanding and knowing my weaknesses and nurturing and catering to those as well. Mm hmm I love that. So it's like respecting, under being aware of both sides and respecting mm -hmm. those lines. Yeah. 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 That is, that is awesome. Uh, so I have one more question for you yes. today. So for those who feel they are sort of trapped in the dark, right now there's so much going on. There's so much in the world that so many are confused about, are saddened by. So for those feeling in the dark, looking for hope, what words could you share? How do we, how can we help people find that light from within? This might sound odd, but I think for me, whenever I start feeling like really down and dark and like hopeless, I remind myself that everybody is feeling like this right now. And that unity in that sadness really helps me. Whenever I call a friend who I think is for sure not just sitting on the couch all weekend like me watching trash TV because I'm like so unmotivated to do everything and they say oh no 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 I've been feeling like super sloth like like really kind of down I would never want my friends to do that but there's to feel that way but there's something in that hearing that other people are going through this too gives you permission more because you don't feel like you're just on an island by yourself you know like whenever you're feeling depressed at home you feel like the world is being extra productive and everything's turning except for you right and so i always say reach out to people you know find that commonality because for me when i feel that unity in that sadness it helps me almost get out of it because I feel like, okay, we can do this together. It's not just me, I am not alone. Even if it's strangers. When I see someone share something that's very real on Instagram, it empowers me because I go, oh my God, I feel that way too. And so I think it's important too for people to know that, you know, if you look at my social media, I probably look so active, which I am. Like I'm, I'm somebody that's always moving, even though sometimes I really would like to stay still more. Um, but I have, days where I just sit watching Love is Blind on Netflix for two days straight. Do you know what I mean? And I think people aren't aware of that, that especially with social media now, it's like a highlight reel of everyone's lives. Like, so understand and know that there's so, everybody is going through this right now and give yourself permission and give yourself permission to, to be loving towards yourself 
if you're not being as productive as you want to be or you're not being as proactive as you want to be and trust that you'll find it. You know what I mean? There's so much I want to do. I want to have such a productive morning and I'm not a morning person and I struggle with it every day, every day. I'm like, I set my alarm for seven and then I snooze it till like 9.30. And I'm like, why did I do that? Why did I do that? <laughs> it's so frustrating. And then I get like depressed and down on myself and I'm like, oh, am I ever gonna get my morning routine back? What am I doing with my life? Oh, I guess I'm just gonna watch Netflix again today or just like whatever. And just knowing that other people feel that way makes me feel so much better and it helps me get out of that slump. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you are not alone. We are all not alone. And I think we need to like connect more in that way and not in just a uplifting, like we got this way. It's like, sometimes we don't <laughs> and it's okay. Let's all lay on the couch today together. Let's all <laughs> eat our faces off with pizza and nachos together just for today so that we can get back up again tomorrow. You know what I mean? It's okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love that. I love it. It's like, it's okay to write a day off. Like, fine, take this day. Do that. Yes. Be there. Give yes. yourself permission <laughs> to be in yeah. that space. <laughs> we move so quickly. We move so, so quickly that, you know, I, I'm the kind of person I know now, you know, at 38 years old, thank God, that if I don't have time by myself to recharge, I'm a mess. I, I need that. I can't have somebody in my space 24 hours. Like, even if a friend comes to visit, it's got to be like a weekend more than like two, three days, I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, you have to know these things about yourself and allow yourself that sloth-like thing, you know? So many people put success in a box. For me, success is like, and a, the key to life is simplicity and adaptability. You know, I think we overcomplicate things so much. And so giving yourself permission to just be simple a little bit mm -hmm. sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And then when you're ready to get up and roar and, thrive and do all the things and write the books or whatever you want to do, you'll do it, do it. Or give yourself that sloth I thing and then set an hour a day to do whatever you want to do. You know what I mean? There's so many mm. things, we're just so hard on ourselves. And just remember like everybody feels this way, makes me feel good. Yeah, no, that's, and, and that's, it's so true because it's, it's sometimes that in the dark is where we find is where we find the light, right? You can't see the, the light without the dark. So you have to have both yeah. those sides. So yeah. uh, I know every time I feel like way too like sparkly, I'm like, I've been really, really happy for like a month. I'm like, what's coming up? <laughs> you know? and, not, and not in a bad way, you know what I mean? But it's like, I appreciate the lessons. So whenever everything is too smooth, I'm like, where's the lesson? I know it's coming soon. Gear yourself up. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love your story. I love your laugh. I love your smile and um, this conversation. Thank you so much, Tori, for Thank taking this so time much. and uh, sharing sharing you and for helping all of us just become a bit more aware now. Thank you so much. Thank you.